Welcome to episode number three of Women of Hollywoodland, the podcast that uncovers the feminist dawn of Hollywood. So firstly, massive apologies for the inadvertent little hiatus last week. I had a rotten cold and it turns out that a blocked up nose and a fairly sensitive microphone don't a pleasant listening experience make. I did about 100 takes and they all sounded like Darth Vader making pervy heavy breathing phone calls. So you're welcome for sparing you that. Um, also, before I start properly, um, can I just say a huge thank you to those of you who have rated or reviewed this podcast already, including 13 of the Clock, Dora Doolittle and LJ Star 30. It really does make a massive difference and is very much appreciated. And if you do rate or review or share, please feel free to tag me. I'm Women of Early Hollywood on Instagram and Chill Divine on Twitter so that I can thank you in a future episode. So... In some ways, this week's episode should really have been the first one because we're going to talk about the amazing Mabel Normand. And it's actually because of Mabel Normand that my whole obsession with early Hollywood and specifically the female filmmakers of the period came about. When I was a teenager, I went to see the movie Chaplin, which may or may not have had something to do with a wee crush on Robert Downey Jr. And there was Mabel Normand, played by Marissa Tomei, directing. My little future film student heart set alight at the sight of a woman kind of dressed like Mary Poppins, this would have been 1911, 1912, shouting at all these guys and telling them what to do. Now the irony is, of course, that in the 1992 movie, Dan Aykroyd's Max Sennett dismisses Norman's talents as a director. Now to be fair, the scene is based on true events, at least according to Chaplin, as the movie is based on his autobiography. Norman directed Chaplin in 1914's Mabel at the Wheel, um, and as Chaplin's biographer Kenneth Lynn puts it, in her role as director, she did not take her responsibilities lightly, as Chaplin would discover in a notable showdown between them. They fell out because he wanted to add like an extra bit of business, like another gag to a particular scene, and Norman, as is her right as director, was like, no, the scene is fine as it is, let's just shoot, and Chaplin threw a strop. And that's more or less how it happens in the film Chaplin. In his autobiography, he says, I could not take it and from such a pretty girl. Now in his version, Senate was totally on his side, stepped in to supervise the direction of the rest of the picture. Now the Keystone Company archives lists Mabel as the director of Mabel at the Wheel, while Moving Picture World reported in 1914 that Mabel Normand and Max Sennett collaborated in the direction of this picture. So it would seem to back up Chaplin's claims that there was some kind of switch at some point during filming. Now in the movie, Sennett kind of puts Norman down and uh, says something like, she thinks she can direct and he laughs. Now, whether or not he maybe said something like that to Chaplin, like to calm him down, in reality, Max Sennett had the utmost respect for Mabel Norman's filmmaking talent. He'd brought her out from New York to help him both establish and run Keystone Studios. In his will, he stated that 50% of everything he had was to be left to her in recognition of her contribution to his empire. Unfortunately, she died long before him, but I guess it's the thought that counts. The actual Max Sennett's version of Chaplin's early days in Hollywood was that his apprenticeship lasted for, quote, a dozen one and two reel pictures, during which time he learned to direct from Mabel Normand. And further, Chaplin may have objected to Normand's direction on the grounds that she was a woman, but he had the exact same problems with Henry Lerman, who also directed him at Keystone. So I think we can maybe surmise that Norman's gender wasn't the awkward wee egomaniac here. Have you guessed I'm not a big fan of Chaplin? Well, of his personality. I suppose he was kind of funny. Incidentally, you maybe already knew this, but it was Max Sennett who put up the famous Hollywood sign. Uh, in those days, it read Hollywood Land, hence the name of this podcast. He brought that stretch of land up in the Hollywood Hills intending to develop real estate on it and he put up the sign to kind of like announce the purchase as a sort of publicity stunt. Look at how rich and famous I am. I can put up a sign just because I can. And then he lost all his money in the crash and he never developed his real estate. So the sign stays. Now before we go any further, it is important that we establish that Mabel Normand was awesome. 
I think I've said before that if I could time travel, I would go for lunch with Frances Marion and her whole crew, but scratch that. I would go and hang out with Mabel Normand anywhere, anytime. Although actually she was kind of part of the same girl gang when she married Luke Hody in 1926. Frances Marion was involved in helping to throw her bridal shower. So hopefully I would be a lucky time traveller and I would find them all together and there would be cocktails and maybe Gary Cooper and anyway... Like, put it this way, I'm obviously in awe of Lois Weber's talent and what she achieved, but Lois Weber once left a vaudeville theatre company because it, quote, proved too superficial for my altruistic aims, whereas Mabel Normand was, according to producer Hal Roach, the wildest girl in Hollywood. When Hal Roach told her not to swear or talk dirty around young, impressionable girls on the lot, she swore more and she talked dirtier. And even once she was a huge star, the kind of undisputed queen of comedy of the movies, she was famous around Los Angeles for being a menace behind the wheel of her lilac limousine. She was also witty and funny, a voracious reader. Even on her deathbed, she was devouring book after book. She set out to learn French for no particular reason. She called Mary Pickford a prissy bitch uh, to a reporter. And she gave interviews like this. What do you like best to do? Pinch babies and twist their legs. Don't dare publish this, people wouldn't understand. What do you most enjoy? Dark, windy days when trees break and houses blow down. Favourite flower? Weeds, if I buy them myself. Orchids otherwise, but I'll take anything. Ideal man? A brutal Irishman who chews tobacco and lets the world know it. But say a Gibson man, it's more refined. Favourite food? Chocolate cake. Iced an inch high. Fat or no fat? I love it. Now, as I've mentioned once or twice uh, in these episodes, in the early days of Hollywood, writers, directors, stars, producers, everybody mucked in and just did whatever was needed to be done to make a movie. Uh, And nowhere was this more true than at Keystone. Karen Ward-Mahar describes it in Women of Early Hollywood. At Keystone Studios, all employees within a production unit, actors, director and crew, hammered out ideas for scenarios, which were then turned into scripts by the writing staff and submitted to Max Sennett for approval. Even after approval, each unit was free to improvise within certain limitations during the shoot. So because of this process, it's tricky to know exactly who was responsible for what. It really seems at times as though credits were all but arbitrary. And for this reason, we don't really know exactly how many movies Norman wrote or directed. But what we do know for certain is that she was a leading creative influence at one of the most successful studios in Hollywood and unquestionably the queen of comedy of the teens. In 1912, she listed her profession as director in the Los Angeles City Directory, and in December 1913, Moving Picture World reported that the leading woman of the Keystone Company since its inception is in the future to direct every picture she acts in. This will undoubtedly make Keystone even more popular than ever. Mabel Normand was born on Staten Island in 1895 in what's probably her definitive biography, Mabel Normand, The Life and Career of a Hollywood Madcap, Author Timothy Leffler says, As an adult, when asked about her childhood, Mabel was often a cheerful and dedicated liar. Even amongst close friends, the first chapter of her life was noticeably vague, a deflective joke, a flippant reply, endearing but not revealing. He suggests that this hints at her having grown up in the kind of poverty that really doesn't make for amusing anecdotes. Though he later describes how, while at school, Norman was both a dedicated and accomplished athlete and, quote, never mindful of Victorian etiquette, she routinely defeated both boys and girls alike. Have I mentioned that she was awesome? And we do know that in her early teens, she went out to help support her family by modelling, most notably for Charles Dana Gibson, as in Gibson Girls. Now, the Gibson Girls were arguably the turn of the 20th century's answer to kind of like Victoria's Secret models in terms of being a sort of like go to ultimate reference in feminine beauty. And Mabel Normand was certainly gorgeous. Frances Marion would once describe her as a girl whose complexion makes you think of gardenias. But even in those early images, it's really her personality that shines through. I mean, Mabel Normand established that kind of funny, vivacious, ballsy, sexy type. And then in decades to come, Carol Lombard, Barbara Windsor, Goldie Hawn would, would embody. And sure enough, she soon came to the attention of D.W. Griffith, who was then directing at Biograph in New York. But Griffith, who would of course go on to make Birth of a Nation and Intolerance, 
was a dramatic director and Normand was all about the comedy. His assistant at the time was Max Sennett and Normand and Sennett quickly became collaborators, close friends and most historians agree a couple at least for a time. So when Sennett struck out on his own to form the Keystone Studio, he took Mabel with him. The very first Keystone release featured a short called The Water Nymph. In those days, because most films were shorts, it was common to release a couple together, almost kind of like a single and a B-side for anyone old enough to remember those. The Water Nymph starred, and again, most probably was at least co-written and co-directed by Mabel Normand. In it, Normand wears a swimsuit, which by our standards is pretty modest. But simply by being tightly form-fitting was scandalous at the time, and it was meant to be. It was deliberately modelled on the suit that had got champion swimmer and diver Annette Kellerman arrested for indecency in Boston a couple of years before. Now at Keystone, this kind of dream team of comedy developed with Sennett, Norman, Fatty Arbuckle and Charlie Chaplin. When Sennett first went along to see Chaplin perform with a touring company from England, Carnot's Comics, he brought Norman with him and it was she who persuaded Sennett to sign him. It was in a Mabel Norman film, The Bangville Police, that the legendary Keystone cops first appeared. And it was in another Mabel Norman film, Mabel's Strange Predicament, that first features Chaplin's The Little Tramp character. She came up with a pie-in-the-face gag that's maybe been used once or twice in the century since. And that iconic silent film image of a woman tied to railroad tracks? That's Mabel Normand. And she was known at the time for doing all of her own stunts. A review of one of her earliest hits, Tilly's Punctured Romance, and one with an awesome girl power ending, by the way, in which Mabel and Marie Dressler, having fought over Chaplin, decide to both dump him, states that Normand, quote, gives as good as she gets. And producer Hal Roach, when asked what made Norman funny, replied, you knew that if a guy kicked her, she'd kick him back. You know, which is an unusual take on gender equality, but you know. And indeed, a lot of her films ended up with her getting the best of some dopey guy, very often Chaplin. Um, And although there's been a bit of backlash about that kind of comedy lately, in the context of the teens, I mean, a hundred years ago, when women couldn't even vote, it was pretty pioneering stuff. Indeed, a critic of the time, uh, Julian Johnson, reported that Norman knows more about screen comedy and has made better screen comedy than any woman actively photographed. Now, in 1915, Keystone merged with the Triangle Film Company, which in a way was its undoing. Triangle was a more professional studio, for want of a better term, and insisted on proper scripts being developed and also followed, which ruined that wild, madcap improv style that had made Keystone Keystone. It wasn't long before Chaplin, Arbuckle, the Normand were all off, and Sennett himself wasn't far behind them. In 1917, Normand announced that she had quit Keystone to establish the Mabel Normand Feature Film Company, along with Triangle's boss, Thomas Ince. Now, Thomas Ince, you might have heard of because of his mysterious death aboard William Randolph Hearst's yacht not 10 years later. The, shall we say, unsubstantiated version is that Hearst shot him accidentally whilst aiming for Chaplin, who was having an affair with Hearst's mistress, Marion Davies. There was a pretty awful film made about it a couple of years ago with Kirsten Dunst playing Davies called uh, The Cat's Meow. Anyway, so at the time, Norman gave as her reason for leaving Keystone that she wanted to make more substantial films. I wanted better pictures, she said. I was getting tired of grinding out short comedies to bolster up programmes in which other stars in other companies, as well as our own, were featured in pretentious films and were paid far more than I was. Now that brings me to a general point that that actually applies really to all the female filmmakers of this period. I love how seriously they took themselves and their work. Do you remember, I think it was last year, maybe two years ago, there was a bit of flurry of discussion about the wage gap and specifically how it applies to Hollywood. Jennifer Lawrence wrote an essay about how through the Sony hack she discovered how much less she'd been paid than her male co-stars. Now one of the things that kind of came out of all of this discussion was that female stars don't negotiate as hard as men do. They're just happy to be cast and conscious of how much more they earn than the average person anyway. So they don't feel comfortable quibbling about like another million dollars, even though their male co-stars do. Lawrence said, but if I'm honest with myself, I would be lying if I didn't say that there was an element of wanting to be light that influenced my decision to close the deal without a real fight. I didn't want to seem difficult or spoiled. 
But in the teens and the 20s, women filmmakers and stars had no such compunctions. Mabel Normand eventually earned $4,000 a week at a time when most Americans didn't make that in a year. The very first actor to sign a contract to a studio worth a million dollars was Mary Pickford. And even in the late 20s, very much the tail end of this golden age for women in Hollywood, Greta Garbo was famous for going on strike whenever she didn't think she was getting paid enough, which by the way worked. She eventually signed a contract to Paramount in 1929 that made her the highest paid woman in America. So it's interesting that this so-called innate female quality of not demanding raises or not negotiating the best deal possible was actually established decades after women started working in the industry. Anyway, under this Mabel Norman film production company, Norman produced just one film, 1918's Mickey. Now, Mickey is one of these frustrating stories in which almost every film historian will tell you it was a disaster. There was some mad story in which one of the directors kidnapped some footage, allegedly something to do with non-payment. And they also point to the fact that the Mabel Norman film production company dissolved soon after and she never produced independently again as proof that it was a failure. Now, it is true that the budget definitely grew during production and the shoot kept on getting extended with reshoots, but these are most likely due to Norman's failing health. She'd suffered from tuberculosis on and off since the age of 10. And most importantly, Mickey grossed $18 million, making it one of the highest grossing films not only of that year, but of the entire era. The Journal and Republican called it the greatest picture ever seen. And it was such a hit that it was one of the first instances of a movie kicking off like a whole trend. In the mid-twenties, a writer from Moving Picture World wrote, Mickey became an ec epidemic. Mickey hats, dresses, clothes, and pretty nearly everything else filled 37 storefront windows in one town alone. So it was the kind of disaster I think most filmmakers would be pretty cool with having produced. And after her company was dissolved, which had more to do with Triangle's money troubles than Mickey or Normand herself, Normand went to work for Samuel Goldwyn, releasing a string of hits between 1918 and 1920, before returning to work with Sennett, who, having now left Keystone himself, was releasing comedies through Paramount. And incidentally, while Norman was based at his studio, Sam Goldwyn ran into some money troubles himself. As I mentioned last week, the kind of post-war recession hit Hollywood pretty hard. And one day, while he was in his office stressing over how he was going to pay his wage bill, Mabel Norman strolled in and handed over a bond for $50,000, which saved the company. It's amazing to think that if she hadn't, there quite conceivably might not be an MGM today. Now, I've quite deliberately avoided mention of her personal life so far, simply because that tends to be what everyone else focuses on. If anyone's heard of Mabel Normand anymore these days, it's probably as a cocaine addict, unsubstantiated by the way, which I'll get back to, as the woman who allegedly threw herself from Santa Monica Pier having discovered Max Sennett in bed with another woman, or most famously as a suspect in the murder of her close friend, director William Desmond Taylor in 1922. As the Women Film Pioneers Project at Columbia University puts it, scholars would do well to refocus attention on Norman's distinctive contribution to early cinema and slapstick comedy, as well as her, the nature of her directorial work for Keystone. But that said, it's impossible not to mention that in the early 20s, her career was rocked by a series of scandals. Her co-star Roscoe Arbuckle was accused of raping and causing the death of a young actress over Labour Day weekend in 1921, which, by the way, I'm actually planning right now an entire podcast series on. Um, uh, it was a scandal that dominated the news for the best part of that year in the next picture, like O.J. Simpson times 100. And while Arbuckle was still on trial, Paramount director William Desmond Taylor was shot in his home in February 1922, and Mabel Normand was the last person to see him alive. Though the Taylor case actually remains unsolved to this day, Normand was exonerated from the investigation fairly early on and she had nothing to do with the Arbuckle scandal at all other than being professionally associated with him from their Keystone days. But the fact remained that her name was kind of tainted by association with what became a huge concerted effort to clean up Hollywood's so-called den of iniquity image. Plus, the idea that she was a cocaine addict was becoming more and more established and maybe she was, we don't know for sure either way. But most people refer to it as an established fact and it really wasn't. Like, for example, Eddie Sutherland described an unnamed actor. This is to Kevin Brownlow in his seminal work on the era, The Parade's Gone By. 
Everyone who took drugs in the industry was started by this man. He was one of the quietest, nicest actors I've ever known. He put Mail Normand on the junk, Wally Reed, Alba Rubens. All three died as a direct result. Except that Mabel Norman died of tuberculosis, which casts a little bit of doubt on accounts like that and others. Bear in mind, this guy was being interviewed in the 60s, so it's hard to know to what extent he was just repeating rumours that he heard at the time. Further, though, during the Taylor murder investigation, allegedly several known LA dealers came forward to kind of say that they regularly served her. Detectives later confirmed that no illicit drugs were ever actually found on her or proven to be connected with her. Now that said, it's certainly true that she started looking more gaunt and underweight in each film after Mickey. But again, she had TB, she'd had it since childhood, and her health was pretty steadily failing for a good decade before her death in 1928 at the age of 35. A press report at the time stated, Miss Norman died at the Pottinger Sanitarium, Monrovia, early Saturday morning after waging a losing battle for over a year against tuberculosis. Miss Norman had wasted away until she weighed scarcely 50 pounds at the time of her death. And either way, she continued to work, right up until her death actually, she was shooting a film, but she was definitely demoted from major star almost to jobbing actress around the time of the scandals. So let's just put our feminist tin hats on for a second. It's all a little bit interesting from the point of view that all this went down at the exact same time Lois Weber was being systematically written out of Hollywood history. Now, not to suggest that Bill Taylor was killed in order to defeminize Hollywood, though frankly, that's about as likely a theory as many that have been bandied about in the century since his murder. But there were a lot of rumours that connected Norman to the case that were never substantiated by police, despite one of the most thorough investigations California had ever seen. Like the drugs connection, for example. The story went that Taylor might have been shot by drug dealers, angry that he was helping Norman to get clean and so losing them a major customer, which is a pretty convoluted motive for murder, if you ask me. Also, newspapers reports at the time suggested that Norman had a $2,000 a week habit, and actress Claire Windsor later pointed out that the amount of cocaine $2,000 would have bought you in 1922, you would have needed a dump truck to deliver it. So at the very least, her using was grossly exaggerated. Now, there's a book about the Taylor investigation, A Cast of Killers, by Sidney D. Kirkpatrick, which recounts director King Vidor's attempts to investigate the Taylor case in the 60s. Now, it's semi-fictionalised, and many of the details in A Cast of Killers has been discredited or at least called into question, but it still remains one of the more definitive accounts of not only the case, but the whole kind of era of the case. And one of the theories it suggests is that Mabel Normand was basically hung out to dry by the studio over the case as a way of them being able to get rid of an over-the-hill actress who was on an expensive contract. Except Mabel was still making successful movies until she took the hit of the scandal. And simply because she wasn't the only powerful woman to have her career all but disappear in a puff of blue smoke in 1922, it all becomes a little bit interesting. And one other such woman was Julia Crawford Ivers, the very first studio head. And we're going to get to know her next week. Thanks again for listening to episode number three of Women of Hollywoodland. And sorry again for its tardiness. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please consider sharing, subscribing, rating, reviewing, all that jazz. And please also feel free to pop over to hollywoodlandseries.com if you have any questions, comments or thoughts. I would love to hear from you. Thanks again and see you next week. Women of Hollywoodland is written, edited and produced by me, Claire Duffy. It's part of the Hollywoodland project and if you'd like any more information on that, please pop over to hollywoodlandseries.com.